On February 24, 1941, in a drafty hangar at RAF Cranwell, a young test pilot named Jerry Sayer strapped into a cockpit that looked like a child's toy welded to a stovepipe. No propeller, no piston engine. Just a long, narrow fuselage with a single exhaust nozzle glowing dull red behind him. The aircraft was the Gloucester E-2839, the first jet ever built in Britain. It had no weapons, no radar, no armor. It carried 160 gallons of fuel and one man. The Air Ministry had given it a budget of $10,000 and a deadline of whenever it's ready. No one expected miracles. Sayer pushed the throttle. The Whittle W-1 turbojet behind him howled like a banshee. The little aircraft rolled forward, lifted off after 600 yards, and climbed into the English sky at 370 miles per hour. The flight lasted 17 minutes. When Sayer landed, he tack sacks to the hangar, shut down the engine, and said four words that changed aviation forever. It's the future. But the future was not guaranteed. Britain was fighting for survival. The Battle of Britain had ended four months earlier, but the Luftwaffe still owned the night. German bombers raided London, Coventry, Liverpool, 40,000 civilians dead by spring 1941. The RAF had spitfires and hurricanes, brave pilots, and radar, but they were losing the war of attrition. Germany had jet technology, too. The Heinkel He-280 had flown in April 1941. The Messerschmitt Me-262 was already in prototype testing. British intelligence knew the Germans were months, maybe a year, ahead. The Air Ministry faced a brutal choice. Option 1. Keep building piston fighters. Safe. Proven incremental improvements. Option two, bet everything on jets, risky, unproven, could fail spectacularly. They chose option two. The decision was made in a single meeting on March 7, 1941. Air Marshal Sir Wilfred Freeman, the man responsible for RAF aircraft production, sat across from Frank Whittle, the jet engine's inventor, and Lord Beaverbrook, the Minister of Aircraft Production. Whittle was 33, exhausted, and nearly broke. He had been begging for funding since 1929. Beaverbrook was blunt. How fast can you give me a fighter? Whittle said, 18 months. Beaverbrook laughed. You have 12. They compromised. 15 months. The aircraft would be called the Gloucester Meteor. It had to be in squadron service by June 1943. No one in the room believed it was possible. They were wrong. The story of how Britain built the world's first operational jet fighter in 15 months, while being bombed every night, is the story of desperation, genius, and industrial improvisation on a scale that defies belief. This is that story. Frank Whittle was not a pilot. He was not an engineer with a degree from Cambridge. He was a 22-year-old RAF cadet in 1929 when he wrote a thesis titled Future Developments in Aircraft Design. Page 47 contained a single paragraph. The gas turbine, if properly developed, could power an aircraft at speeds exceeding 500 monobarme. His instructors gave him a B-. They said jets were science fiction. Whittle didn't give up. He patented the turbojet in 1930. He built a prototype engine in 1937. It exploded on the test stand. He built another. It ran for 15 minutes before melting. Investors laughed. The Air Ministry ignored him. By 1939, he was running experiments in a disused foundry in rugby, funded by $2,000 from a private bank and sheer stubbornness. Then Germany invaded Poland. Suddenly, the Air Ministry remembered Whittle. They gave him $10,000 and a contract with Powerjet's Lundalit. The first W-1 engine ran successfully in April 1941. It produced 860 pounds of thrust, less than a modern hairdryer. But it worked. Gloucester Aircraft Company was chosen to build the airframe. They had never designed a jet. Their last fighter, the Gladiator biplane, had fabric wings and an open cockpit. The chief designer, George Carter, looked at Whittle's engine and said, where do we put the propeller? There was no propeller. The Meteor had to solve problems no one had ever faced. Problem one, the engine ate fuel like a battleship. A piston fighter could stay airborne for two hours. The W-1 gave the E-2839 17 minutes. The Meteor needed new engines, 
the W-2B producing 2,000 pounds of thrust each, two of them, but fuel consumption was still brutal. The solution, wing tanks. The Meteor's wings were fat, ugly, and full of fuel. It looked like a pregnant Spitfire. Pilots hated it. Engineers loved it. Range, 500 miles. Enough. Problem two, the jet blast would melt the runway. Early tests at RAF Barford St. John showed the W-1 exhaust hitting 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Tarmac bubbled. Grass caught fire. The fix, steel mesh mats laid on grass airfields. Primitive, effective. The Meteor could operate from forward strips, a tactical advantage no piston fighter had. Problem three, compressors stalled at high angles of attack. Jets don't like sharp turns. The intake air gets disrupted, the engine coughs, and thrust dies. German jets would suffer this fatally. The British solution, twin engines, nacelles mounted mid-wing. If one engine stalled, the other kept flying. The Meteor could dogfight, barely. Problem four, no one knew how to arm it. Machine guns, too weak, cannons, too slow, rockets, unreliable. The answer, four 20 millimeter Hispano cannons in the nose. Simple, brutal, 800 rounds per minute. The Meteor would not outturn a Spitfire, but it could delete anything in front of it in one burst. The production timeline was insane. March 1941, contract signed. July 1942, first prototype, DG-202 flies. May 1943, first production Meteor F-1 delivered to 616 Squadron. July 27, 1944, first combat, Meteor shoots down V-1 flying bomb, 15 months from drawing board to combat. How? The answer was decentralized chaos. Unlike American or German programs, the Meteor was not built in one giant factory. It was built in shadow factories, hundreds of small workshops scattered across the English countryside. The wings came from a furniture factory in High Wycombe, the fuselage from a bus garage in Coventry, the engines from Rover in Barnoldswick, until Rover botched it and Rolls-Royce took over in a midnight raid, stealing blueprints and staff. Every component was designed for simplicity and interchangeability. No custom parts, no hand fitting. If a wing didn't fit, it was scrapped. The RAF couldn't wait. Women built the Meteor. 60% of the workforce at Gloucester were female. Many had never seen an aircraft before 1940. They learned to rivet aluminum in three days. They built 200 Meteors in 1944 alone. The Germans were stunned. On June 6, 1944, D-Day, a Luftwaffe reconnaissance pilot over Normandy, spotted a twin-boom aircraft with no propeller diving at 500 nautilus. He reported, Enemy aircraft? No prop. Speed impossible. It was a Meteor F-1 on a test flight. The pilot, squadron leader John Waterton, was just joyriding. The first operational use came on July 27, 1944. Target, V-1 flying bombs. The doodlebugs were terrorizing London. 10,000 launched, 2,400 hit the city. The RAF needed something faster than a Spitfire. 616 Squadron deployed eight Meteors to Manston. First kill, Flying Officer Dean flips his Meteor under a V-1, matches speed, and tips it with his wing. The bomb spirals into the channel. Second kill. Pilot Officer Roger uses cannons. The V-1 disintegrates. By August, Meteors had destroyed 14 V-1s, the only jet-on-jet -jet kills of the war. The Meteor F-3 entered service in December 1944. It could fly at 490 mile an hour at sea level, 100 mile an hour faster than the Mi-262. It had longer range. It could operate from grass strips. It was easier to maintain. The Mi-262 was a masterpiece, but it was built like a Swiss watch, in a country running out of tungsten, chromium, and skilled labor. The Meteor was built like a Ford truck, in a country that had learned to make do. By May 1945, Britain had 210 Meteors in service. Germany had 300 Demi 262s, but only 100 were flyable at any time. Engine life, 10 hours. British jet engine life, 100 hours. The RAF never used the Meteor in air-to-air -air combat over Germany, not because it couldn't, because the war ended first. The jet age began in a barn in rugby. It was born in blood, fire, and blackout. 
It was delivered by women who riveted wings by torchlight. It was flown by boys who had never seen a jet before. 1943. Frank Whittle never flew the Meteor. He watched the first squadron take off from RAF Morton Valence in 1944. He cried. The Air Ministry had said, Ten years. Britain did it in fifteen months. The Gloucester Meteor was not the fastest jet. It was not the prettiest. It was not the most advanced. It was the first to fight. And it proved that in war, speed of production beats perfection every time. 